Ephesians chapter 6, let me get down to the nitty-gritty of where we're going. Boy, I got to tell you what, I got some good, I'm glad we're streaming, recording, because I really wanted this on recording, because I think it's uh, just the content of it. I know what scriptures I have in here, and the scriptures are good. It's going to help us understand some things, hopefully. Uh, Ephesians 6, 10. Uh, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I would just underline his and it's, it's got to be God's might. You cannot do this life on your own. You can't do it. There's no way. You, you depend on your flesh and your biggest enemy is going to He says, I'm not doing it. But he did walk into battle armored, did he not? He walked into battle. Let's see, I'm going to go back to that. There we go. What do I have up there? No, I had it right. Uh, he walked into battle armored with his faith. He had a helmet of salvation. He had a sword of the Spirit. He had his shoes with the preparation of the gospel. I mean, he had all of that. He had the shield of faith. That's why he was not... David was angry with Goliath. Not necessarily, he wasn't afraid, but he was ticked off that this big hulking beast would come into the, the land that Judah had been given by God to. It, they were trespassing on property that was not theirs. They threatened war. They put this giant out there thinking nobody could face him. And they were going to rule over God's people. And David said, not while I'm alive, not on my watch. It's not, not going to happen. happen. And he didn't, he did not flinch a beat. You had the whole army of Israel sitting down on their hands on the side of a hill. You had the Philistines on the other side of the hill. David and Goliath going to meet in that valley. It kind of reminds me of the battle of uh, Armageddon. And, um, but anyway, David took care of business. And I guess that's the picture the Lord Jesus Christ paints to us. Is that he went out there prepared exactly the way the Bible says. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. I may, I may do another teaching on uh, the ability to stand and what it's all related to and so on. It, uh, understand this, that, I, you know, I was talking about the difference between man and beast this morning, and I, and I probably could have put this, and I, don't, I didn't think of it last night, but God did not design any of the animals to be able to stand upright like a man does, okay? Birds, birds come close. They have just two feet with wings, um, but their primary mode of motion is flight for most birds. Uh, but anyway, uh, when it comes to like four-footed beasts and all those that the Bible mentions, I mean, we've seen chimpanzees walk around on two legs. We've seen dogs do it, trained dogs or whatever, but it's not in their nature. It's not natural to them, and they cannot walk for any given time on two feet. God gave man the ability to stand on his own two feet. What I think will happen is when people receive, willingly receive the mark of the beast, that it will change their uh, nature because it's mingled now. Their DNA is being mingled with something and I think with a beast. And I think it's going to change man's nature. And there's just something about standing versus falling or crawling or slithering or whatever, creeping thing. Um, I think that is a, a good illustration. Verse 12 is where the, where the real grit is, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Uh, and I would say maybe, maybe including our own. You want to get to some of the problems, and I'm going to show you this tonight. You want to get, you want to get to some of the problems you're having in life. Always first attack it from a spiritual point of view. And I'm saying first, I'm not saying that you don't have to do anything regarding your flesh. There are all kinds of things in the Bible that tells us that things that we ought to be a part of, like I was teaching this morning, things we ought to be a part of, things we ought not be a part of, things we do, things we shouldn't do. And um, so anyway, uh, let's say that you want healing and you have uh, some kind of illness or syndrome or disease or you got aches and pains or whatever and you're tired of it, um, it I would advise you to go to God first and I will say 
It's okay. Call the doctor. Okay? But go to God first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And uh, it's certainly not going to hurt you. Say, God, I, you know what? I have had people say, God, I can't live like this. Show me, sh will you heal me or do something for me? And then all of a sudden, they'll be put in contact with the exact right doctor or medical facility that they absolutely need, and boom, just like that. And I do believe God works that way. There's no doubt in my mind. Medicines work. Doctors work. Uh, what is it? A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, the Bible says. So anyway, go to God first. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Let's pray. Father, I pray to your God. Lord, I thank you, God, for leading me in the direction that you did with this. And I pray to your God that it's a blessing uh, to these people. I pray it's a blessing to all those who are watching now and those who will be watching this later. Father, Lord, I want to I be a help. I want to be a benefit to your kingdom. I want to serve you. I want to do right. And I pray, dear God, that as your word says, remind me, God, that our labor is never in vain in the Lord. Never. And Father, I pray, dear God, whether small or great, Lord, that you would do something in the hearts of your people and my heart as well. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people say to that, amen. amen. All right, we dealt with, uh, we, we went through the scriptures and we looked at the difference between earthly principalities and worldly or heavenly principalities. There are principalities in the, in the physical realm, and you're going to see that in Scripture, but never, ever, ever, ever forget that, that whoever is in charge is always going to be led by a spirit. Man does not uh, go through this world without getting some form of inspiration. Um, I, do, uh, I obviously believe that the Holy Spirit works in those of us who are born again, leading us and guiding us, growing us, maturing us, using us in various ways according to His Word. So then that means then that all the lost people, and I'll take you to the verse right now, turn to uh, Ephesians 2. Just a few pages back. Here it is right here, verse 2. We're in a time, I've read this so many times. We're in a time past you walked according to the course of this world. According to the what? That's a principality right there. The prince of the power of the air. Uh, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. It, it amazes me how dumb people are, especially in this country. People who, people who know the Bible. And there's this, uh, some kind of... They call it um, anime, that Japanese cartoon stuff. They invented a character called Avatar, um, the air... No, yeah, the airbender. He is one of the four... Um, in witchcraft, they call them watchtowers. He's one of the four watchtowers, which basically means it's a dragon... In witchcraft, they have four dragons, and those dragons work through the four uh, occult elements: earth, air, fire, and water. And um, here we have the prince of the power of the air, and then this avatar. And avatar is like what Christ is to us. He is the mediator or the go-between between, between us and God the Father. Without Christ, we have no right to approach God the Father because we're sinful. He is holy. So what God did in the Old Testament, he used Moses, he used the prophets. And now in the New Testament, Jesus Christ himself is the mediator between us. And avatar in the Hindu religions, in the occult world, is that same thing. He is a half God, half human. He's an in-between and he operates on behalf of the gods and on behalf of the people in the earth. You just got to follow him and do witchcraft. And you're in. But that's the spirit right there. And why is there so much witchcraft in this country? Why is it growing? Why has it moved into the churches? Didn't just fall in there all its own. I guarantee you that 
these spirits that are over principalities and areas of authority, they moved those people to do certain things. And it's always subtle. If you don't know what to look for, you will miss it. And so um, keep that in mind, because I mean, I'll show you that in example here in a little bit. Um, let's see here. We, we showed that last week, the difference between earthly powers and spirit, spirit principality. So a principality um, is a spirit that works through uh, government, kingdoms, any kind of place where there is an authority, these spirits work in that realm. Uh, if, if you have a, a bad and wicked and crooked mayor, I watched a documentary last night about um, Biloxi, Mississippi, and there was a lawyer that was a lawyer for the Dixie Mafia down there, and they were scamming people out of hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they put it, gave it to their lawyer, this crooked lawyer, he put it in a safe deposit box because the, the mob leader down there, some guy wanted to use that money to get out of prison early. He had a life sentence. And so all of a sudden now, all that money came up missing. And he was in a partnership with another lawyer there. And when they found out the money was missing from that lockbox, that crooked lawyer blamed it on his associate. Now at that time, they weren't associates anymore. That uh, other... Um, lawyer went on to become a judge down there and his wife was on the city council and she was running for mayor and they were they were going to go against all the corruption so anyway when they found out the money was missing they called the crooked lawyer and they said what happened to all the money he said I, my partner took it all blamed it on him so a few years later and twenty thousand dollars paid to a hitman out of texas his hitman walked in there shot both of them graveyard dead shot them both in the head four times and walked out and uh, it took them about 10 years to finally work their way up. By the time they had gotten to that crooked lawyer, he was already mayor of Biloxi, Mississippi. He ran for office, went to church, made himself look like he was one of the decent guys, crooked as a dog's hind leg. He's the one that set all that murder in motion. And they had to work from the bottom up, arresting guys, giving them sentences, telling them they can get get off easier if they give who was responsible for it. it took them 10 years to get to that crooked lawyer so that lawyer who was mayor of Biloxi Mississippi who's leading him God or a principality spirit principality spirit absolutely because you know what the first thing he did was the 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 judge's wife on the city council running for mayor they were wanting to bring in all these casinos to Biloxi and turn it into a resort place with all these casinos her and her husband were against it. The good Christian people of Biloxi were against it, but the mafia wanted it because they could run it. What's the first thing the mayor did when he got in office? They show him on TV breaking ground for this new casino. And now Biloxi, Mississippi has got casinos all over the place. I wouldn't go there. But that's a principality. That's how they work. So any place where there is a realm of authority, you're going to have principalities working in there. Now, look at it from God's side. I gotta wet my whistle here. Isaiah 11. This are this is the seven spirits of God, and these spirit this spirit. I'll say it like that, because it is seven, but it's one. When we get to heaven, we'll know it better. Okay, but for right now, it is the Holy Spirit who lights seven candles, lights the way of life with seven candles the first one is he is the spirit of the capital l capital o capital r capital d now why did i spell it like that john knows i've been going through my copy of the septuagint it's the greek translation of the old testament ptolemy I don't know if the P is silent or the T is silent or the whole word silent. Ptolemy the first, I believe, he was a Greek pharaoh of Egypt. And he spoke Greek, wrote Greek. And he heard about 
the law of Moses. And he, as a ruler, wanted to look into the law to see if there was anything there that would aid him in leading his people. Sounds like a good king. So he selected, or uh, I don't know if he selected or somebody did, but he wanted, he wanted two men from each tribe of Israel. So there's, uh, no, let's see, that don't work out, does it? How many would it be? It, it started out being, he wanted six men. Six times 12 is 72, right? Okay. But for some reason, two of them dropped out or something like that, and it ended up being 70 Hebrew Jews speaking, writing, knowing Hebrew, and they knew Greek. They were well-versed, well-trained Greek because of the Greek Empire and Alexander the Great. The Greek language had already moved through the Middle East and the known world at that time. And so he wanted a copy. He couldn't read Hebrew, but he read Greek. And so he wanted a copy of the, of the Old Testament in Greek so he could read it. Those 70 men set about to translate the best they could the Word of God from Hebrew into Greek. Now, in your King James Bible... You, you always see that L-O-R-D in all capital letters. Let me explain this again in case maybe you forgot or haven't heard it before or didn't pay attention the last time, uh, which would be me a lot of times. But the Spirit of the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, means that in Hebrew, you have four letters. And remember, Hebrew doesn't have any vowels in it. There's no E-I-O-U. There's no letter for that in Hebrew. It's all consonants stop they stop the air rather than let the air flow and that's there's a biblical thing with it greek has vowels and so these men knew that whenever they saw the god's name in those four letters yod hey va hey that when they saw that they wrote the Lord. In Greek, the word is kurios or kurios. So I've explained it like this. If you have a curator of a museum, he's the one who is the Lord of that museum. And I'm not sure where all else that word might flow into in our, in our language. But kurios only means one thing. It means Lord, period. Every place in the New Testament, in the Greek New Testament, every time you see the word Lord, what's it going to be? Kyrios. Everybody say Kyrios. Okay. Why then is everybody now calling him Yahweh? Did you ever read in your Bible the name Yahweh? Never did. Where did it come from? I don't know. Don't care. But that's not what it says. For, and remember, the Septuagint, this Greek Old Testament, was translated 300 years before Christ came. So that makes it 2,300, 2,300 years old of... God's name being the Lord. And it's established. But then everybody wants to come and change it. Oh no, he's, we, we've looked into the original languages and we say that it's Yahweh. I wouldn't trust that. I used to say that years and years ago. I don't say it no more. I think that it's possible that this then, oh boy, I don't know. I don't know if I can say that or not. I think the Spirit of the Lord is going to lead you into calling God what He wants you to call Him. I've been, I've been harped on by these what's called sacred name people. They're crazy. They, they've been told that you've got to say Yeshua and Yahuwah, and you've got to say God's name in Hebrew or God won't listen to you. He doesn't know what you're saying. He's going, mm -hmm, I can't hear you. I'm not even listening. And you don't, your prayers go nowhere. Okay, that's what they tell everybody, that we're all going to hell because we believe in Jesus and we call God the Lord.
But that's his name. And that's the spirit that he's given and imparted into his people. Okay? Don't judge anybody yet because some people are not there. They'll get there. Okay? Just pray for people. So we have the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. That means that God's spirit literally is going to lean or work in him, move him, give him ideas, inspire him, show him things out of the Bible. He'll be driving along or she'll be driving along one day and all of a sudden a verse of scripture pop into her mind and the Holy Ghost will give her a, a meaning for that for her life or for something that's going on. And I mean, you'll get doodads and you'll start crying up and everything like that because you know God just visited with you and he helped you with something. That's the Spirit leading us, guiding us. When I say that God said to me something, I didn't hear it with my ears, I heard it with my heart. And I believed it in my heart that that's what God was saying, that's what God led me to. God led me to this book in no uncertain terms. I, was, I knew exactly what God was saying. So anyway, that was the Holy Spirit. Then it's the Spirit of Wisdom. That's the second one. So when you are in a situation where you cannot choose between A and B, God will give you wisdom, not only to know what to pick, A or B, but why you picked it. That's wisdom, okay? Somebody, maybe an old timer, will do something funny. And you'll think, what is he doing or what is she doing? Why does she do it that way? Well, when you ask them, usually they've got a good reason why. And you're going, oh, that's what it's for, you know? So anyway, then we have the spirit of understanding, that helps us when we're reading the Bible or when we're in a situation, we can understand it. God will lead us and, told, and show us things. The spirit of counsel. Who needs a counselor? Amen. We all need a counselor. Somebody to tell us what to do. Give us their ideas. Get, t tell me what road to take. Tell me what if I'm supposed to go A or B. Then we have might, which is God's power in us. Remember, Ephesians says... Uh, in the power of God, in the power of God's power, not in our own power, in the power of his might, it says. So right here, the counsel, spirit of counsel and might. Then it's the spirit of knowledge. That is God. Oh, man, I'm going to get started again. This is God giving you knowledge of what the word of God says. And you base your life experiences, your choices Everything you do, right or wrong, God is leading you. Now, when I say wrong, God may tell you that it's wrong. You just go ahead and do it anyway. Face the consequences. Deal with it. But God has given you knowledge of the Word of God. And this is one of the things that I'm... Boy, my nose is just itching me crazy tonight. Um, Alicia, can you rub Benadryl cream on the end of my nose for me? Would you do that for your daddy? Oh, she would. But anyway, in the time that we're living in right now, I've been talking about how they're changing the New Testament constantly. Not only in the Greek Bible Committee, but all the publishing companies constantly changing their Bibles. But then you've got preachers doing it behind most of the pulpits, constantly changing God's Word. They don't like what God's Word says, so they just come up with an excuse to translate it differently, and that's what they do. And, and in that sense, I read a book by Jim Baker. Y'all remember him? 700 Club, got busted, had to go to jail. Uh, he decided when he was in jail that he'd read the Bible. And he told the, he told the dirty secret behind all these big name ministries. He said, I didn't write no sermons. We had a, a group of people that got together for every show that we did. They figured out how much money we needed to raise that day and what it would take to get people to send it in. Then we wrote down a brief outline of what we wanted, how we were going to get it, and then we went and looked for verses of Scripture that tell us that that's what we're supposed to do. In other words, they did it backwards. Instead of God giving them light and understanding, and they're going, thank you, God, and preach that, they said, we're preaching this, and we're going to make God say it. And God said, nope, I didn't say it. Spirit of knowledge, teach you what God's word says. And the fear of the Lord. How many of you fear God? You better. You better. He'll get you. All right. Now, here's how this works. Isaiah 28. Um, there are 
Uh, here we have, we're talking about Christ here. In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory and for a diadem. Now, a crown and a diadem, those are crowns. Who do they fit on? A principality, a king. Remember that the beast comes up out of the sea, has seven heads, ten horns, and what? Crowns. The dragon that comes up. What does he have? Crowns. He's a ruler. The beast is a ruler. And so here we have uh, in verse 6 now a spirit of judgment. God, that's what we just read here. The spirit of, uh, well, no, it's not there. Knowledge, though. And then, um, yeah. And for a spirit of judgment to him that sitteth in judgment and for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. So we have strength here and we have a spirit, which is God's spirit, giving you the sense to know how to judge something in the sense that you look at a situation and you think you know the right course, then judgment kicks in and we either work in our best judgment or we go against our better judgment. Does that make sense to everybody? I've done the stupid things and went against my better judgment, ended up in trouble, okay? You don't want to do that. You want God's spirit in you, giving you a spirit of judgment. Isaiah 9, I like this. For unto us a child is born. That's Handel. Uh, unto us a son is given, and the government, there it is, shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. Oh, Jehovah's Witness, have a field day with that. And the Mormons, the Everlasting Father. Wrap that around your head. He's the son, but he's the father. The prince of peace. I'm all for fighting a war if we have to, to maintain our country, our freedoms, our liberties. But we don't need to be in everybody else's business around the world. And there's too many people in this country that are trigger happy trying to get us in wars. We're going to have a king that's going to come down, settle it all, and there's not going to be no wars for a thousand years. Amen to that. He's a prince. He's going to rule it all. Ecclesiastes. Oh, I like this. All go into one place. And this is Solomon now. He's telling you about how life ends up. He said they all go in the same place. All are of the dust and all turn to dust again. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward and, here it is, the spirit of the what? Beast. That goeth downward to the earth. They go down to the earth. They don't go to heaven. Wherefore I perceive... So there is a spirit of the beast there. Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works... For that is his portion, for who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? In other words, you're never ever going to see what happens after your life ends. You're not going to see how that affects everybody. You're not going to see what end is going to come up. There's no way we can do that. So we just have to trust God. Amen? Uh, I keep talking about Caleb and the promise that God made me. And I've told God, God knows my heart. That he doesn't even have to do it in my lifetime if he don't want to. Maybe my passing or mom passing uh, will get his heart. And he'll want to turn himself around. And uh, that's my prayer. That's my prayer for him. So we have all of that. And then Ecclesiastes 10. If the spirit of the ruler. There it is. Now you have a, a principality spirit that is working through someone who rules over territory, rules over people, rules over things, rules over money, whatever it is. Head of the household, uh, things like that. Always, guys, men, husbands, uh, there's always going to be a devil working on you to remove you from your authority position. Don't let them do it. Don't let them. Call unto God. God, need help here. Okay? If the spirit of the ruler... That's why you need a shield of faith. 
and all that stuff. If the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place, for yielding pacifieth great offenses. You know, there's wisdom in this Bible. I'm like thinking that if this election goes sour, maybe I'll just go to Kenya. I think God might have us just stay where you are. Okay? Stay where you are. We don't know what somebody's going to do today, tomorrow, a year from now. We don't know that. Unless God shows it to us somehow. So, there, there again, you got to trust God. All right, now. Here we're going to, I'm going to move through this. Notice in Isaiah 4. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. So it looks to me like there are principality spirits that are meant for destruction. Let me give you one. He's actually called the destroyer. He shows up in the book of Exodus and this devil goes through and he destroys. He kills all the firstborn in every house and the only thing that stays him away from it is the blood of the Lamb. Amen. So you will have, uh, man, I don't even know how to, how to describe this. A spirit of judgment, a spirit of burning. It just seems like some people, and the way they live their lives, everything they do is a waste. Everything they do, it just leaves rot and corruption. I watched another little documentary yesterday. I was bored, I guess. And uh, it was about this guy that lived up in Skidmore, Missouri, up in northwest Missouri. He was the town bully. He had been that for years. He bullied that town. He would shoot people. That He, he never fist fought a man. He'd always just take his pistol out, and he wasn't afraid. He wasn't afraid of nobody. He wasn't afraid of the sheriff. He wasn't afraid of police. He was afraid of no man on this earth. And he'd just shoot people. Just shoot them. And if he killed them, so what? I think they said he had been pulled into court 20 some odd times, 21 times, that they had things on him that they could arrest him for, convict him of, throw him in jail or throw him in prison, and he got out of every single one of them. And so he killed a man and... The judge gave him a bail to set. Well, he set bail. He stole a, a couple's 12-year-old daughter. Got pulled up to the school bus, pulled his pistol out, waving it at the bus driver. The bus driver stops. He gets out, gets on the bus, grabs this girl. He's been looking at her for a while now. Grabs her, takes her off that, throws her in the truck. And he works out a deal later because they arrested him for it. He works out some kind of deal where he got her to marry him. Because he impregnated her. And so now he gets away with that. And uh, so anyway, he, was, he, was, he posted bail. The, the prosecution was going to move to uh, violate his probation and put him back in jail. And the morning they had the hearing, this guy didn't show up. He just didn't bother to show up. So the judge said, well, we... And, 50 some odd people from that town walked into that courtroom because they wanted to make sure that that guy did not intimidate any witnesses. They were going to they were going to make sure this was done right. And so the judge tells them, folks, we can't do anything. He's not here. So they all went out in the street. They found out he was in the bar across the street. Well, they all walked 50 people walks in this bar and they stand there staring at him. He's sitting there sipping a beer. And he takes his time like there's nothing wrong. Buys a six-pack, walks out, him and his wife walks out, gets in the truck right in front of the, of the tavern, right in downtown. And as soon as he gets behind the wheel, he's going to put his seatbelt on. Bam, 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 bam. About nine shots rang out. To this, that was 1983 or something like that. To this day, there were 47 Witnesses, they circled his truck. 47 witnesses to that murder. And the sheriff heard about it before it went down. He took a vacation. 47 people surrounded this truck. 
They shot him dead in that truck. The, the gal and her baby got out, and to this day, not one person has ever said a word about who did it. Not, they know there was about three different types of ammo used. That much they know, but they can't trace it to anybody. Listen, that's a spirit of burning, something like that. This guy just destroys everything he touches, okay? You think a spirit leads people like that? Good grief, they do. Uh, Isaiah 29. This is big. Isaiah 29, verse 9. Stay yourselves in wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken. You've heard about this drunken laughter in churches. Uh, Rodney Howard Brown and his brother, Basil, I think for a while he was doing it. I don't know. But they just go around to these churches putting off this drunk spirit on everybody. Everybody rolls on the floor laughing hysterically, making animal motions and sounds and all kinds of evil stuff. They're drunken but not with wine. They stagger but not with strong drink. So what are they drunk with? The Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep. Boom. So there's a spirit that can rule over people, put them spiritually asleep and drunk. And when you're drunk, Isaiah 28 says that all the tables are full of vomit. And when you drink, you cannot see, you stagger, you don't stay in the way. Christ is the way. You don't stay in that. You're out of line. You're, out, you're not in the doctrine. And that's the spirit that works through that. And it's not just that Pentecostal or charismatic spirit that that, that place is. Any place where there is a blatant false gospel, false doctrine being spewed out of people, that also is a, is a drunken spirit because they cannot read the Bible. They do not have any understanding of it. When you try to, try to reason with a drunk person, Okay? You don't. Okay? So anyway, so a spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. So if God gave them the spirit of slumber, who can remove the spirit? God and only God. Be careful, especially you folks online. Be careful about following somebody online that has what they refer to as uh, like a deliverance ministry. Because often, I won't say always, but often, they use different types of rituals. And I'm just not, I'm not for that. Uh, I don't see rituals given to us in the Bible. Okay? I see baptism the way it's supposed to be. I see the Lord's Supper the way it's supposed to be. But there's nothing in Scripture that tells me I have to say these words. And I have, to, I have to use this phrase and I have to do it like this and so on because I've seen evidence of people doing that. They, they say, well, you're saved, you're born again, you're filled with the Holy Ghost, but you've got a devil in you. That's a lie. If you are saved, you cannot be possessed, period. You can be harassed, you can be oppressed. You cannot be possessed. There's no place on the Ark of the Covenant in your heart for God and his buddy Lucifer. Okay? No way. So, um, spirit of deep sleep. Close your eyes, prophets, you rulers, seers. Anyway, spirit of sleep. Oh, Romans 11. Verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And again, God is the one who can take that away. And God has. Amen? God has taken that away. 1 Corinthians 2.12, Now we have received not the spirit of the world. There it is. There is a spirit of this world. And it's a, I would say it falls in the category of a principality spirit. It rules, like in Ephesians 2, it rules over everybody that has lost the children of disobedience. They will not obey God. They will not walk with God. And God gives them that prince to rule over them, uh, a spirit of this world. But the spirit which is of God, that we might know. See, the spirit gives us things to know. 
the ideas that you have in your head about maybe something in the Bible. That wasn't your idea, unless it was wrong. Well, maybe it was a devil telling you the wrong thing. But if it's got any worth to it, God's Spirit gave you that. God's Spirit gave you all of those things. And what did He charge you for that? Nothing. That's why we don't charge anything. Uh, there was a man visitor here this morning, and I was told that uh, he, uh, his friend, who I've known for years, um, brought him here to meet me. He's been wanting to try to get him in touch with our ministry. So I had somebody go back and get me a stack of DVDs, and I gave it to him there. And I'm, I'm just hoping then that God will take what's in those, and he'll have interest in it, and he'll watch it. And then God will deliver him from that spirit of this world because he has it. So you pray for him. You know, I think his name was David. You pray for him. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.7 For God has not given us the spirit of fear. And I, I can absolutely say amen to this. I have been hounded, harassed, oppressed, chased messed with everything you can think of by a spirit of fear, especially when I'm in Kenya. Now, it's been a while, but I'm telling you, my first trip there, that McDonald's sign when we first landed in America was the greatest thing I ever saw. It meant you're back in America now. But I'm tell Alicia will tell you, I mean, I was sour for two weeks. The first week, we did nothing but preach everywhere. And then the second week, we just kind of went around and saw some things. And I wasn't right until after we got home. Uh, but it, I was hearing things in here. Leave, get out, you don't belong here. And that is not the only time that's happened. So there was a spirit of fear. And uh, God finally removed it. You resist it long enough, they'll leave. But of power and of love and of a sound mind. Look at this, 1 John 4, 3. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. It's that wherefore ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Now, I, I'm not sure I can explain this. The beast has not arrived yet, but his spirit is everywhere. I could show you symbols, I could show you buildings, locations, I could talk about certain people. You've got a spirit, I could tell you the papacy. The papacy, the popes of Rome, that is the spirit of Antichrist. Our Puritan forefathers believed that and they preached that. That's why the popes hated them. They hated Luther, they hated Calvin, they hated Huss, they hated Wycliffe, they hated all these guys because these guys called the pope the Antichrist. Well, you don't take that sitting down. You're the Pope. You just hire a bunch of Jesuits and go kill the guy or ruin his life. And buddy, they still do it. You think the Catholic Church is sitting around just waiting for stuff to happen the way they want it? No, sir. They're making it work. They have the spirit of Antichrist on them. 1 John 4, 6. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. Think about that. When you're right with God, and you know him because you know the Bible. You can hear preaching. And it may scald you a little bit. But you're okay with that because you need it. You need a good washing. You need a good preaching to. You need a good lesson. And when you're right with God, stuff like that doesn't bother you. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth. So what would that be? The Holy Spirit and the spirit of error. So, in the, and I'm not saying I was possessed, but in those days where I abandoned my regard for the King James, I said what I heard my professors say in Bible college. What I heard other preachers say and what I thought would make me feel good. I would say, 
Now, in, in, the, in this verse here, a better translation is, and I know what I thought back then. I was young, and I wanted everybody to regard me as high up. And so I thought, if I give them an alternate meaning behind some word in the Bible, Greek or Hebrew, then they will not be able to know that until they get it from me. That's how stuck up I was and stunk up. And I mean, I did it deliberately. And there was a spirit of error leading me in that. Now, does that mean God was trying, but he couldn't get past it? God allowed it. And why would God do that? Why would God allow somebody to be in error like that for a while? It's the only way we learn. Your mama tells you to don't touch the stove or don't touch the iron. and You don't believe her. So what do you do? Once. Once. You don't do it again. Okay. Uh, talking about four-wheelers this morning. Um, I rode a three-wheeler one time. They'd been outlawed. They, they made them illegal because they were so dangerous. And I remember taking off on that thing one time. I didn't have no helmet. Didn't think nothing of it. I was about 17 years old, bulletproof, you know. And I was down at the youth camp down in Niangua. And that thing got away from me, and it bounced, and I thought I was going to come off of that thing. And I mean, I'm on a hillside kind of a, like this, and there's big rocks coming up out of the ground, you know, southern Missouri like that. And I slowed that thing down, and that scared me. You know what I did? I pulled that thing up to Dale McCurry's house. I parked it. I didn't get on it again. I never got on a three-wheeler after that. I can only think of maybe once or twice that I've been on a four-wheeler. I just too many things. You just learn that, all right? Yeah, let's move on. Oh, look at here, Ezekiel 1. Now we're going to talk about UFOs. Take a look at this. Ezekiel 1, verse 20. This is the, they have the four angels, and they have four faces. They have feet like calves' feet. They have four wings. Two they fly with, two they cover themselves with. And um, then uh, there is that, uh, the, I can't think of it, the platform or whatever it is, and there's a throne, and there's a, the, there's a man sitting on it. Well, then there is these wheels next to it. And whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. So these angels, somehow, some way, extended their spiritual influence or something like that, and when they got to the wheels and brought them in, then the wheels basically became an extension of them. They were alive, as was the entire chariot. The chariot of God is 20,000, even thousands of angels. So the whole chariot was a living thing. And when these angels brought these wheels in, then their spirit, which means that they didn't have to go, whoop, come on, let's go, pull the chariot. They didn't have to do that. Whether they ever, wherever they wanted to go, it's where they went. They wanted to go here, they just thought of it and they went that way. That's what the wheels did. When those went, these went. And when those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Now, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you a loaded question. Is it possible that an inanimate object can appear to move, to, I don't know, do things, to speak, to do something with something that's here in the room? Do you think that's possible? Huh? Revelation 13. They made an image of the beast, and then it had life. 
and it had a brain. It had a will, it had a desire, and it, it decided that everybody should worship it or him, and if they didn't, you get their head cut off. So I would say yes. And I, I think some of these so-called Catholic miracles, you know, that happen around the world where you have like a statue of Mary and tears coming down her eyes. Uh, in some cases, you'll have a statue and it looks like the mouth is moving. Um, some people see statues where the eyes move and there's some documentation to show that this could very well be a real thing um, I think it's not outside the realm of possibility I think it's very possible and you mentioned Revelation 13 and uh, I would add this along to that I think uh, all this time no idol that we know of has ever really talked and done the things that we see that but in Revelation 13 that all changes it all changes. And it's going to be something the world has never seen before. All right. Isaiah. Oh, turn to 19. Turn to chapter 19 of Isaiah. I better stop here. Isaiah 19. Boy, that's a good chapter. Because you know what it says? It says Egypt is going to worship the Lord. You read the chapter. I'm not going to get that far with it. Uh, look at verse 7 real quick. What does it say there? The paper reads? That's what I've been telling you. That's where we get the word paper. It comes from the word papyrus. And it's those big thick weeds or reeds that grow along the Nile River. And they would take them, cut them off. And uh, they would take the layers and weave them together. They would use some kind of mud or something like that on one side of it. Smeared it all out there and set it out to dry, and boom, they had good, stiff paper to write on. And that's where we get our word, and that's why the Bible translated as the paper reads by the brooks. Anyway, back in verse 1, the burden of Egypt, you're going to see a principality here. Behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud, and shall come into Egypt, and the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence. Look at that. And the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. And I will set the Egyptians against the Egyptians. That sounds too much like America. We are a divided nation. There is no doubt on either side. We are split. And if God does not intervene, things that are divided fall and you can't have your kingdom against your kingdom so look at it the Egyptians against the Egyptians and they shall fight everyone against his brother and everyone against his neighbor city against city and kingdom against kingdom you know what that sounds like to me what Jesus said in Matthew 24 nation shall be against nation and kingdom against kingdom I think Jesus was quoting Isaiah 19 and verse 3, and the spirit of Egypt, this is its principality. And Egypt is always known in the Bible for being a type of this evil empire that's going to rule in the last days. Pharaoh is a type of the Antichrist. Um, Ezekiel refers to him as a whale and so on. But anyway, the spirit of Egypt, the principality spirit of Egypt shall fail in the midst thereof. In other words, God is going to remove the hold that that spirit has over the people of Egypt. And I will destroy the council there. Look at it. God said he's not only going to fail the spirit, but he's going to destroy the council that it was giving. Now, I got something I'm going to teach you here in a minute related to this. And they shall seek to the idols and to the charmers and to them that have familiar spirits and to the wizards. Why is it always four like that? It's a false gospel. One, two, three, four. Idols are a false gospel. Charmers are. Familiar spirits are. And wizards are. Verse four. And the Egyptians will I give over into the hand of a cruel Lord. 
And a fierce king shall rule over them, saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts. Again, why would God do that? He's doing that to cause Egypt to cry unto the Lord. There were times in this country, in the history of this country, major times when God's people finally cried, even when people who were not Christian called unto the Lord. God heard them and God blessed this nation once again. Our history is full of it. Most nations are. And, um, but every now and then, God, God has to do with them what he did with Israel in the book of Judges. He puts them under cruel authority. And listen to me. God will do the same with you. If you walk against him, go contrary to him, God will put you under the hand of cruel authority. A fierce king to rule over them. This is a principality spirit. Both the spirit, I would say both the spirit of Egypt and this king. Both of them are. Now, what does the word genius mean? I know in the dictionary they have a picture of it and it looks just like me. Why is he laughing at me? What'd you say, John? What'd you say, John? Genies? Yep. The word genius comes from a tutelary or moral spirit who guides and governs an individual through life from Latin genius, guardian deity or spirit which watches over each person from birth Spirit, incarnation, wit, talent, also prophetic skill, or the male spirit of a gens, originally generative power or inborn nature, um, to give birth, beget, with derivatives, referring to procreation in familial and tribal groups. What's left out of here is the uh, religious aspect of it. Um, in the Middle East, the different various spirits that they believed in, they called them jinns. That's where we get our word genie from. D-J-I-N-N -N is their spelling. And those jinns were responsible, they believed, for most of the things that happened throughout the day. If the milk went bad before it was supposed to, or the chickens didn't lay any eggs, then they would say that there was a, some kind of jinn that was around that was causing that. Uh, or as is, I believe, the case, whenever someone had a revelation or a good idea or something, the right thing to say or something, something like that, or how to do something, how to invent something or whatever, I absolutely believe that a spirit works in that situation. Think of it like this. How did Moses know when God said, I want you to build me a tabernacle, an Ark of the Covenant, I want a candlestick with seven candles in it, I want a table with bread on it. I want, a, I want, I want, um, uh, I want an, an altar for you to burn animals on and do it all. Hurry up. How do you think Moses knew what to do? Number one, God showed him the pattern that was in heaven. We know that from the New Testament. Number two, we know that the spirit of knowledge and understanding was not only on Moses, but upon the people who were designing this and putting it together. God was working through them and showing them because he said, seed that thou uh, doest it according to the pattern that I have showed thee, something like that. And so God's spirit was leading them and making all the little rings to hold the curtains on, the decorations to make the, uh, the candlesticks, how to, how to decorate the Ark of the Covenant, what kind of bread to put on the uh, table of Shobat, how much to put on there, what animals sacrificed, everything was given to them by revelation of the Spirit of God. Now flip that upside down. Where do you think, who was it, Jimmy Page? Who sang for, um, um, oh, I can't think of their name. Huh? No, they sang Stairway to Heaven. Um, that, what was it? What is that group? Come on. Huh? What's another name for a blimp? Ze Led Zeppelin. Jimmy Page of, of the rock group Led Zeppelin moved into Aleister Crowley's house. Yeah, where he did all these rituals and pulled up this demon that looks like Yoda from Star Wars. 
anyway, and where he saw lamb, this spirit that looks exactly like gray aliens. Anyway, Jimmy Page moves in there and he starts writing Stairway to Heaven and he says something just took over and lots of rock singers tell you that, that they had help writing. It said it just came out of them. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, the lady who wrote all the Harry Potter books, she was not an author. She was not already published. She was out of work trying to raise a, a child or two or something like that. And, and sat in internet coffee shops every day. And all of a sudden, this stuff started coming out of her with this character, Harry Potter. And he's got a lightning thing on his forehead. He's got a mark on his forehead. And all this stuff about Harry Potter, where do you think that came from? It didn't come out of her mind. It came from a djinn. It came from a spirit that guided her, telling her what to write, showing her things that she had never heard of before. Uh, rock singers, rock groups will say, when we get on stage, something takes over. Um, Sasha Fierce, who is that? Beyonce. Beyonce says when she gets out on stage, a spirit takes over her. She's got a name for it. Sasha Fierce is her name. And this spirit takes over her and she says, don't mess with me I'm on stage. I, I, there's no telling what I'll do. Some of the things they're able to do with their music, their picking, their singing, is just out of this world and you know that it's not just normal um, Robert Johnson was a was a black man down in the deep south back in the 1930s 40s somewhere around in there and he had a guitar and he loved to go on these honky-tonks and play with the band problem was he was no good and they just kind of put up with him but every now and then they would throw him out because he wouldn't stop and they said get on out of here you're no good well one day he just went out and left everybody and he went down to this intersection, a crossroads, looks like this. And he stood right there in the middle. And he asked the devil to come give him the power to play the guitar. He wrote about it. He sang about it. It's a documented thing. He got some kind of spirit in him. And a few months later, he shows back up and they're going, oh, good grief. There's Robert Johnson again. What are we going to do? Throw him out? No, let him play. They found out he added an extra string to his guitar, Matthew. Instead of six, he's got, what is it, five, six, seven. He had seven strings on his guitar. And he played things that people now, they say, well, how in the world did he do that? Just in a matter of a few months. He's, he's called the father of rock and roll. I believe it. But that is, a, that is not an abnormal situation. This kind of stuff, understand this, this kind of stuff happens every single day with most everybody around the world. There is always some spirit either working for you or against you. A couple more and then we'll close. Hosea 4.12. My people ask counsel at their stocks. What is a stock? investment you buy in a company it's a tree limb a stick what do they do with the tree limb carve it make a god out of it burn the rest of it in your fireplace and cook your meals with it still the same tree they ask counsel at their stocks and their staff declareth unto them for the spirit of whoredoms hath caused them to err. See, there it is right there. A spirit of error is what we read earlier. Now it's a spirit of whoredoms. In this case, it probably is real physical whoredom. But I would say spiritual as well. And God warned about this to Jerusalem back in Ezekiel 14. He said, you're out playing the whore, the harlot, to everybody that walks by. And I'm going to get you for that. So he said, the spirit of whoredoms hath caused them to err, and they have gone a-whoring from under their God. Hosea 5, 4, next chapter, they will not frame their doings to turn unto their God. For the spirit of whoredoms is in the midst of them. Right here. It's in their heart, John. It's in their heart. And they have not known the Lord. You know, I think that is probably true of a lot of people who go to church. Um, 
I watched another documentary yesterday. <laughs> I must have got off on... I started watching videos about the Appalachian Mountains and Cades Cove. If you ever out there, go to Cades Cove. But it turned into all these Appalachian Mountain bad guys. One of them was a preacher. He was a kid growing up in those mountains down there around uh, uh, Cades Cove, Tennessee. And... Um, Real hillbilly, grew up going to those uh, tent revivals and those church revivals. And he decided he liked that. And he, wanted to, he wanted to live for the Lord. He wanted to do right. He decided he didn't want to shovel coal all day long. He wanted to serve God. So he tried to learn as much of the Bible as he could. He went to all the meetings. And then all of a sudden, every now and then, they gave him a chance to, when he was older to, to speak to everybody. People started liking his preaching. They gave him more opportunities to preach. He was preaching in different churches around. But he had one particular church, that's where he ended up being buried. And he had this one church, and he would preach at it all the time, and people loved it. And he liked the feeling of people loving his preaching. He was really addicted to that. And uh, he would pray, he would pray, and he'd get sinners down at the altar. He'd get people just praying and waving their hands to the Lord and all this stuff. And I don't, I'm not doubting their experience, probably real. But then this guy... Got a sip of moonshine whiskey and decided he liked that. And he said he knew a lot of preachers that took a little nip of brandy or something like that before they preached and then one afterward. And uh, I don't, by the way. And, uh, but anyway, uh, th he knew that they did that. So he figured, well, there's probably nothing wrong with it. And so he just got into it, started hanging around the wrong people. He ended up being a thief, a murderer. He was an escape artist. There wasn't a prison in the world. He cut through bars. He, uh, he crawled through a hole, probably no bigger than this, to escape out of his jail cell and did it. And he was on the 10 most wanted list of the FBI. Ended up shooting a cop. And they're going, man, they're going to go after him. And they put him in jail for a, lo a long time. He had a sentence there. And he decided that maybe he'd just turn his heart back over to the Lord. So he got back in his Bible again, started praying again, started preaching there in the jail. One day he escaped. He went right back to that old lifestyle, killing people, shooting people, stealing, robbing banks and everything like that. And the cops, he went to visit his mother one time. He was on the run. He had a bunch of money. And he left his mama's house. And when he got outside, all them FBI guys was waiting for him out on the road. And uh, as soon as they saw him, there's two different stories. One saying that he pulled out a 22 rifle and started shooting at the cops and he had two pistols stuck down in his waist. The other version says he was running from the cops and they got tired of him. Because he'd escaped like four or five times. Bam. Shot him dead. You know what? They have, he did not know the Lord. He was a fraud. Okay? He was a fraud. Luke 4.33, in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice. Now, again, I'm going to say this. I said it this morning. Devils cannot make you, if you are saved, devils cannot make you do anything. They can't. They can, they can try to push you tempt you i mean the devil we always say the devil tempted me right well it probably wasn't lucifer himself it was probably a smaller devil but either way you were led by an unclean spirit to do something that was wrong you were tempted to do it okay he didn't make you do it but you did it anyway he he teased you he tormented you or he just you just fell into it but then there are lost people and there are people who are possessed of devils. The Bible is very clear on that. This man here had a spirit of an unclean devil in him and it caused him to just cry out all the time. Okay, And um, he was in the synagogue at the time. Jesus had to cast it out. So there are spirits that get into people and they have no control. It's like, it's like Legion who's living in the tombs, the catacombs. He's, you know... Don't have no clothes on. You can't chain him down. He breaks the chains and all this. But when Jesus shows up, delivers him, and he finds himself sit clothed and sitting upright at the feet of Jesus. I love that. 
Amen. That's where I want to be. But anyway, you still, as a born-again Christian, have the choice to do what's right or do what's wrong. They are going to lead you into what's wrong. Now again, God, like I said, may let you go a little bit. But he's going to get you. One way or the other, he's going to get you. He's going to chastise you, love you, tell you. Now see, I told you not to do this. You did it anyway. There's consequences for it. And I'm okay with that because it means that God loves me. I am his son. Amen. Let's stand.